Hi, everybody. We're going to be getting started in just a minute. Uh, if you're having any issues or problems, uh, please use the chat box because everyone is muted. All right, just another minute and we'll get started. All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Chris Bonamy. I am the Deputy Director for the DuPage County Stormwater Management Department, and we are here for a water quality outreach webinar where we will talk about routine and long-term maintenance for detention basins and the benefits that these basins provide. Uh, we will also discuss common problems and solutions that will help to maintain the functionality of these basins. Uh, this is a free webinar and one professional development hour will be made available for your participation. Uh, we have several of these workshops throughout the year. We find that these workshops are a great way to connect like-minded individuals and organizations who are concerned about the local uh, water quality in our lakes, rivers, and streams in and around DuPage County. Uh, these workshops help us uh, are part of our public outreach and education programs and help us meet requirements outlined in our permit with the IEPA, the Illinois Environmental Protection Agency. And uh, this webinar is being recorded. So if you know of others who couldn't uh, be with us today and that might benefit from this information, uh, we can provide a link to the recorded presentation uh, shortly following the presentation. A uh, couple quick thank yous before we begin. Uh, thank you to Mary Mitros. She is our stormwater communications supervisor, and she set up this webinar and lined up our speaker uh, for today's program. And speaking of our speaker, uh, it is our very own Mary Beth Falsey uh, from the Stormwater Management Department. Uh, thanks, Mary Beth, for being here. And once again, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, I know everyone's probably very busy, but we appreciate uh, your attendance at these webinars. Uh, just a couple other comments here. I hope everyone had a very wonderful holiday season and a very happy and safe new year. Uh, as many of you know, I, I like to start the year with a couple of New Year's resolutions. Uh, first off, just a little bit of background. I did put on a few pounds uh, over the last year and especially over the holidays. Uh, in the past, I've tried to remedy that through exercise with little or no avail. So this year, I plan to focus on my diet to lose that extra weight. So for my resolution, I set a goal of 1,500 calories per day. And I've got to admit, I've just been killing it because I have exceeded that goal every single day so far this year. Uh, and it's not even close. I'm exceeding that goal by at least 1,000 calories uh, so I should be looking at some big, big things for 2023. And as far as my other resolutions, uh, that's still a little bit of a gray area because my wife has not told me what those resolutions are that will make me a better and more tolerable person. Uh, but I am really looking forward to that. Uh, anyway, resolutions always make me feel better about myself. And what I really feel good about is the presentation that we have for you today. Uh, but before I turn things over to Mary Beth, I do want to remind everybody that you are muted. So if you do have comments or questions during the presentation, please type those directly into the chat box and we will relay those on to Mary Beth at the end of the presentation. All right, so let me introduce our speaker, Mary Beth Falsey. Mary Beth is the Water Quality Supervisor for DuPage County Stormwater Management. She's been with the county for nearly 20 years. She works on various aspects of stormwater quality, including working on MS4 permit requirements, developing water, watershed-based plans, conducting spill response, and administering the DuPage County Water Quality Improvement Program grant. 
She has a master's degree in natural environmental si uh, systems and soil science from Northern Illinois University. And in her free time, she enjoys reading, going on nature walks and spending time with her two cats. Uh, so with that, uh, Mary Beth, thanks for joining us and uh, take it away. Okay, thank you, Chris. Uh, I've got a lot to go over, so I'll just jump right into it. Um, what we're talking about today is uh, routine and long-term maintenance for detention basins. Again, I'm Mary Beth Balzi with Stormwater Management Department. So if you haven't uh, been to one of our webinars before, I'll give you a little background on DuPage County Stormwater Management. We were established in 1989. We're a countywide program. We are guided by the Stormwater Management Planning Committee and the Stormwater Management Plan. We enforce the countywide stormwater management and floodplain ordinance, and we operate flood control facilities that have a flood water capacity of nearly 6 billion gallons. Our department is comprised of six programs. We have watershed management, water quality, floodplain mapping, regulatory services, flood control, operations and maintenance, as well as shared services. So since we're talking about detention basins today, I wanna to do a little background first and kind of talk about what they are and uh, what they do. The purpose of a detention basin uh, is to store stormwater and slowly release it over time. So when a site is developed, a basin is de developed along with it. It takes in the runoff and then slowly releases it to our waterway. The, the main purpose of detention basins is flood control, uh, stormwater management. Uh, more recently, the function of detention basins has been expanded to include water quality. And the important thing to note as well is these are all connected to our rivers and streams. So all detention bases, basins flow into a storm sewer system or directly into our rivers and streams. And so they're an important part of a urban hydrologic system. One very common question that we receive is, what is a detention basin and what is a retention pond? Um, so wanted to kind of go over that first. Uh, I, I'll use the term basin throughout this presentation, but a lot of what I'm going to talk about applies to both a retention basin or a detention basin and a retention pond. So a detention, Technical, technical term, it's, it's a dry pond. So it'll dry out between storm events. It temporarily holds excess storm water, but then will dry out like you see on the picture on the left. And retention permanently holds back some of that storm water. So you have a retention pond, you have a permanent pool of water. It'll take in more storm water during a rain event, but it will also always retain some amount of water. So that's the basic difference between those two. But again, a lot of what I will talk about will cover both of these. So focusing specifically on DuPage County, uh, we really experienced a surge in land development uh, in the later part of the 20th century. Um, just alone between 1980 and 2000, there was a 40% increase in population. And so there has been a lot of development, uh, went from largely farmland with, with sporadic uh, development uh, to, to what you see on the right today. It's, it's largely filled out and developed. And we have a lot of detention basins that were put in during that time as well. So DuPage County has a lot of detention basins that are around 30, 40, 50 years old at this point. So we don't have an exact count of how many we have in DuPage County. Uh, I know there are at least something like 3,000 detention basins in DuPage County. They usually go along with the property that they were developed for. So detention basins can be owned by an individual, a business. Uh, they can be owned by a municipality or a park district, an HOA, an LLC. It really varies from site to site. Uh, so they're very uh, site specific in terms of ownership. Most of them are privately owned and maintenance responsibility is on the property owner. So now we'll move on and talk about different types of basins. 
So just to start off, uh, just talking about some of the older basins that were built strictly to address flooding. Uh, these were starting to be built around the 1970s, uh, built up to present day. The number one concern was flooding and holding back stormwater, slowly releasing it after a storm event. These were largely planted with turf grass. Um, and they, as you may have noticed, they make a great habitat for Canada geese. Um, as you can see in the photo, um, geese do tend to congregate around detention basins because they're open space. The geese like the open space, they feed on the grass. So that's a common, um, common scene that you'll see around DuPage County in this photo here is, is an aging detention basin with um, turf grass and Canada geese. So the first type uh, I'll talk about, uh, just kind of going back to the detention basin. This is just a basin planted with turf grass. It dries out between storm events. Uh, these are usually mowed regularly and used as open space. Sometimes they can even be used as a park or a sports field. So this is a very um, common type of basin that we see throughout DuPage County. And because they're planted with turf grass, they're usually managed as turf grass. So there may be fertilizer or pesticides applied to them as part of uh, lawn management. And again, geese do tend to really love these areas and congregate there. And the next type is an open water retention pond. It's really a permanent pool of water surrounded by turf grass. The turf grass is mowed regularly. There can be fertilizer or pesticides applied to them. Canada geese really love these areas too. Um, a note about a fertilizer and pesticide application on, on an open water pond is that you can imagine that all doesn't soak into the grass. Uh, and so you get a rain event, a lot of that's going to go right into the water. Um, with the retention ponds, they're built to be aesthetically uh, aesthetically pleasing. They look they look nice to have open water outside of your house, um, and they really do look nice until they don't. So over time, these can really degrade, and we see a lot of issues with these. I'll go into the naturalized basins next. A naturalized dry basin is similar to the turf basin, except the is planted with native prairie vegetation. The benefits of this is they provide treatment of stormwater. The tall native vegetation slows down the runoff. The deep roots absorb pollutants and nutrients from that stormwater before it goes downstream. So these have an added pollutant removal capability to them. And additionally, geese tend to not like tall native vegetation. Um, they, they can't see around them for predators as well. And so the native vegetation in all areas, not just detention basins, helps to deter um, geese from congregating. We also see naturalized basins where it's an open water pond, an open water retention pond with native plants uh, installed around the shoreline or on the slopes. So this can vary from a narrow strip like the picture on the left to a larger, um, amount of native vegetation on the slopes and even into the water, as you see on the right. Uh, the benefit of the native vegetation, again, removing pollutants, so you have enhanced filtering capability of the basin, uh, keeps the geese uh, away, and also the shorelines of these tend to be more stable because you have the tall native vegetation with the deep roots that holds the soil in place better than your mowed turf grass will. Next, we'll talk about wetland bottom basins. These have, they're not a wet pond and they're not a dry pond. So the, the bottom is, is a emergent wetland community. And the benefit of this is it actually mimics the natural benefit of a wetland in terms of absorbing additional stormwater, providing pollutant removal capability, the wetland bottom basin can be designed to infiltrate uh, some water. In addition to holding it back, some of it can be infiltrated to replenish our groundwater systems. So um, these are even better for water quality. And then finally, uh, the, the ultimate construction for water quality would be a constructed wetland 
basin. Um, these are like wetland bottom, but there is slight topography added throughout the bottom. So it's emerging wetland community, but you'll also have a, a low flow channel, some micro pools, some high and low spots throughout. And, and what this does is allow the stormwater to slowly move through the basin, interacting with the native plants. So there's more time that the water spends kind of interacting with the native plants. You have more pollutant uptake. Uh, additionally, you have the infiltration capability in some cases where it can actually infiltrate stormwater and replenish our groundwater. So these have the most water quality benefit uh, of all the basins. So just another plug on the benefit of native vegetation, uh, in addition to providing water quality benefits um, in, in basins and in all areas, native vegetation is better at uh, uptaking nutrients than uh, mowed turf grass. Uh, the tall vegetation with the deep roots can filter pollutants from runoff. Native vegetation communities also provide habitat and food sources for pollinators, birds, and other wildlife. Uh, the wetland basins specifically can infiltrate uh, stormwater, providing additional flood control benefits. The native plants also provide some air quality benefits, so they do take carbon from the atmosphere uh, into the ground and Due to the fact that these are not mowed regularly, we also have a benefit in reduced emissions because we don't, we're not out there with a lawnmower uh, every week. And so they have air quality benefits, they deter geese from congregating, and native plant communities can also have a lower long-term maintenance cost. So now that we've gone over all the types of basins, we'll talk about routine inspection and maintenance. So one thing to remember is detention basins are man-made features. So like any sort of car, your house, a road, they need regular inspections and maintenance, like anything else that's, that's man-made or constructed. And so that's really important to keep in mind. Um, these are built structures and they do require uh, routine and, and long-term maintenance to keep them functioning properly. So the first step uh, in, in maintaining a detention basin is to determine ownership. So you may have this answer already, but sometimes, especially with shared properties, it's not always clear whose responsibility it is. So I wanted to add this slide just to kind of uh, give you some next steps on if you're not sure who the owner is. Uh, the first thing I would do is check out the DuPage County Parcel Viewer. There's a link here, and you can also just Google DuPage County Parcel Viewer and find it easily. This is our online map that has parcel information and ownership for every property in the county. So this would be the first place to start to determine who owns a property. And the next step is to look at any information you may have. If, if you are the owner, uh, if you have a plan of survey or subdivision or a plan of easement, look at that those documents. There may be some maintenance responsibilities outlined in those or any easements um, that, that give maintenance responsibility. It varies from site to site. So you may not always have this information and it may not be written in this information, but it's a good place to start. And a lot of documents can also be found at the DuPage County Recorder's Office. So I would definitely start off by doing some research into the property and trying to figure out the owner and maintenance responsibility. So now that you've determined that you are responsible for a detention basin maintenance, um, we can go into routine inspections. I highly recommend routine inspections of basins. They can prevent uh, bigger issues down the road. So some of the things that we'll go over are blockages, trash and debris, weeds and invasive species, sustainable lawn care, erosion, sedimentation, and algae. So we'll start off with blockages. Um, particularly with blockages, these can really prevent bigger issues down the road. Every basin is going to have an inlet and an outlet, maybe multiple inlets and outlets, and they can all look different. So you really wanna familiarize yourself with what you're working with, where your inlets and outlets are, and then conduct regular inspections to make sure they're clear. 
you can use a rake to clean them off if needed. Um, ideally, you would do this before it becomes a, a serious issue, and then it, at that time, it could be easily cleared off with, with a rake. Um, things to look for are cumul accumulated leaves and vegetation uh, and trash. All these can be blown in and are carried in by water and accumulate at these structures and easily cause blockages. At that point, your basin's not functioning properly. Um, so you really wanna make sure that you conduct routine inspections and clear away any, any trash and debris. I would schedule regular inspections and then also an extra inspection uh, if you know a big rain event is coming, just to make sure that uh, everything's functioning properly before that rain event. So just a couple other images of blockages and what they can look like, or I'm sorry, structures and what they can look like to prevent blockages. So they come in all different shapes and sizes. Uh, as you can see the photo in the middle here, that is a flare dense section that is completely blocked with leaves. Um, and, and kind of hard to see, it's buried in rocks a little bit, but all these types of structures can, can become blocked with, with leaves, trash, and other debris. And you really wanna make sure that they are clear and able to function. So specifically for trash, um, Hopefully you don't see anything as egregious as this photo on the left, um, but trash can accumulate in basins. One way to prevent this is if you have a common open space or a shared space to install signage and trash cans around just so when people are visiting the open space, it's just that much easier to, to not leave trash. Um, I would also schedule regular, regular inspections just to pick up trash around the pond to make sure it doesn't accumulate. Again, it can be blown in by the wind or water and carried in um, and it can accumulate and cause blockages. Uh, additionally to that, uh, it's also, as I mentioned, basins are all connected to our rivers and streams. And so this trash can be carried downstream and pollute our waterways, um, add to the microplastic issue. So, um, encourage regular inspections and also uh, installing garbage cans if it's a, if it's a common space just to, to prevent um, trash accumulation. Pet waste, uh, another concern if you have a shared open space, um, especially with multifamily properties, this may be the only uh, area around the, the residences that people have to walk their dogs. So I highly recommend, recommend installing dog waste stations to encourage people to clean up after their pet. Um, signage and trash cans um, are very helpful, uh, especially signage that talks about transmitting disease and the, the bacteria in, in, in dog poop. So not only is it harmful to our ponds and our waterways, but it can be a, a human hazard condition as well. So. Um, just keeping up with that and make sure, making sure that people that use the space are aware and encouraged to, to pick up after their pets. So no matter if your basin is planted with turf grass or native vegetation, uh, weeds can be an issue. Turf grass basins are regularly mowed, uh, but you can still get overgrowth around structures. Um, in this photo, you can barely see that there is an outlet because it is so overgrown. Um, even if your turf grass basin is mowed regularly, these structures are kind of hard to get around with just a mower. So you might want to encourage uh, your landscaper to weed whip around the structures, keep them visible and clear so you can conduct those inspections and keep water flowing properly. Um, this applies to a native basin as well. Um, we don't regularly mow native vegetation, um, but I would encourage you to even just trim a couple of feet around the structure so you can access it for inspections and to keep it clear. Also for native vegetation, you are going to want a native plant management contractor to perform regular inspections and management of your native plant community, but you can, learn to identify some common invasive species in order to help um, work with your native 
plant management contractor. So just a few I wanted to include that if you manage or oversee a um, basin that or you're responsible for a basin that has native vegetation, these are some of our common invasive species that we see in native basins and you're going to want to look out for these and get them taken care of under control before they um, they can take over an entire pond and so rather than have a healthy native plant community with with flowers and native grasses they can become overrun monoculture of, of these plants so just to kind of highlight each one uh, Phragmite, Phragmites, cattail, sandbar willow, teasel, and reed canary grass. There are others, but these are some of the main ones you may see establishing in a native pond. So I also wanted to touch on some sustainable lawn care practices that can be implemented uh, as part of routine maintenance of a detention basin. You can reduce or eliminate the use of herbicides pesticides and fertilizer. So if you have a turf basin um, it, for the basin itself and even properties surrounding a basin, um, people tend to sometimes over, over fertilize in, in their lawns. Um, you really want to reduce the use of you know, weed and feed, things like that, um, pesticides on your lawn because all that that doesn't get soaked in and used up by your lawn is going to be carried into the basin. Don't mow all the way to the edge of a wet pond um, and consider planting a native buffer strip around the shoreline or around the entire basin that can help uptake nutrients and pollutants and help improve water quality that can also help to stabilize your shoreline. We've been hearing about leave the leaves in terms of benefiting insects and also for health of the soil of your lawn. And that is a great policy, um, but maybe not necessarily around basins. Um, you wanna make sure that leaves are not accumulating in your basin because they can then block the structure. So keep that in mind. Um, don't let leaves accumulate around your inlet or your outlet structures. You can consider mulching them as well as grass clippings. You don't want grass clippings accumulating either. So consider mulching them or composting elsewhere. And then don't dump, dump yard waste in or around basins and discourage any neighboring properties from doing so as well. That's a quick way to block a structure or cause um, algae problems. Now we'll talk about shoreline erosion. This is particular with the uh, open water retention ponds that we see happening that does erosion does occur over time. Uh, things to look for are steep bare slopes around the pond, uh, exposed pipes. As you can see in this photo, um, the pipe was not constructed like that to stick that far out into the water. Um, at one point, the shoreline was at the end of that pipe. And over time, the shoreline erodes away, exposing that pipe. Pipe separation can also occur. So when pipes are installed, they're put in segments and you get enough erosion, it starts to fall apart. And, and that can lead to a more costly fix down the road. So you really want to inspect shoreline, uh, look for pipe separation, also look for loss of land. So is the shoreline just retreating over time and sedimentation into the water. So all that sediment that gets eroded from the shoreline may end up in the bottom of the pond, uh, leading to sedimentation issues. When assessing shoreline erosion, you want to look for severity. So I just have some examples here of shoreline erosion severity. So on the left, we have a stable shoreline. There are some rocks installed around that. That's not necessarily always the case needed for a stable shoreline. It's just a, a good picture that I was able to find. But what to look for, you see a smooth shoreline. That was how it's constructed, still maintaining the shape as it was when constructed. You don't see a steep drop off. 
from the edge of the ground to the water. Moving on to slight erosion. As you can see in this photo, it's kind of a jagged edge. Um, as you can see at the point closest to the front of the photo, um, that's where soil is starting to slough off into the water. Uh, and moving on to moderate erosion, you actually see a significant gap there between the edge of the grass and the water. And then severe, it's an even steeper drop down and you can see that hill kind of pulling back. And it gets even more severe than that, but uh, this just to kind of give you an idea of shoreline erosion severities and your solution for fixing this erosion is really gonna depend on how, how severe your erosion is. A little bit more on pipe exposure and separation. So these can require costly repairs. And another reason to keep up with your inspection of shoreline erosion is to um, fix it and come up with a solution before it gets uh, to this severity. So the photo on the left is um, pipe separation just starting. So that soil has pulled back, unburied that pipe, and where the two sections were connected is starting to come apart. Um, so that's no longer going to function properly, and water through, moving through this pipe can actually exacerbate erosion. And we have a really severe case here on the right photo where multiple segments have uh, disconnected and uh, fell into the water, and that's really not functioning properly. And that, that's a significant cost to, to fix a severely exposed and separated pipe. Now moving on to sedimentation. Sedimentation can occur, uh, really any water coming in or from shoreline erosion uh, can carry sediment into a pond. Um, this can occur in a wet pond resulting in shallower water. It can also accumulate in dry ponds, um, causing them to not drain properly. Uh, the photo here is sediment accumulating at an inlet or an outlet where it's not functioning to move water as efficiently because you have that soil buildup. Sedimentation in a open water pond may result in stagnant water, low dissolved oxygen, algae blooms, and in severe cases, uh, fish kills due to just the, the shallow water. So changes in temperature, uh, fluctuations can, can cause uh, fish kills during certain time of year in a, in a heavily sedimented pond. I just mentioned algae in relation to sedimentation. I wanted to go over common types of algae. This is something we get a lot of uh, calls about, especially certain times of year, um, hot, dry weather. We see a lot of algae blooms in open water ponds. Um, just to kind of highlight some, some different things you might see, on the left is filamentous algae. It looks like a mat floating on the surface. Um, it could be throughout the pond, but it's most prevalent uh, along shorelines. Uh, the next photo is actually not algae, but it is reported as algae a lot. These are two types of tiny little plants that grow and float on the surface of a pond, uh, duck duckweed and watermeal. The middle photo is kind of a combination of those first two. Um, so it's not always clear what you're looking at, um, but they can, it's not always one or the other. You could have multiple types. And uh, I really wanted to touch on the last two photos here, um, planktonic algae and then harmful algae blooms. These two photos look similar. Uh, it, it looks like um, planktonic algae looks like paint in the water. So the actual water column itself turns green rather than having something floating on the surface. These are concerning because not all planktonic algae is harmful, but um, when you have the green water like this, it could be indicative of a harmful algae bloom. And you may have heard about these. They can release cyanotoxins and be harmful to um, wildlife, humans, the dogs that enter the waterway. So we highly encourage you if you have um, water in your basin that looks like these last two photos, um, call DuPage County Stormwater Management. We work with the Illinois EPA on sampling, testing for harm, harmful algae blooms. 
so we can verify if you have one or not. Um, unfortunately, once you have it, there's not really much you can do to get rid of it. Uh, we would just recommend installing signage to prevent uh, people or animals from using the water. We would also send a sample to the Illinois EPA to their lab for confirmation. So a little bit more about algae blooms. The sources um, of algae blooms include high nutrient loads in your runoff. <clears throat> Um, this can be from fertilizer, it can be from goose or dog poop that's um, around the pond. Uh, sediment coming into the pond can also carry high nutrient loads, as well as any leaves or grass clippings that are entering the basin. So the best solution is more of a long-term solution, uh, reducing fertilizer use around the pond and any surrounding properties, planting native plants to absorb nutrients and uh, filter runoff, and kind of the short-term solutions, um, if you already have an algae bloom, would be to hire a pond management company that may be able to rake out or apply algicide, but that's really a temporary fix. You want to look at more of the long-term, where are these nutrients coming from, and how to address them. Okay, so now that we've reviewed routine maintenance and inspections, we can go over long-term plans and solutions that may be needed. So the probably the easiest fix um, for slight to moderate shoreline erosion would be installing native plants around the pond. You can install um, native plant emergent plants as shown here in the photo. Uh, more prairie type plants on the slope. The deeper it stabilize the soil, help to, they're not going to fix the erosion that you have, but they can help hold the soil that you have still in place there um, and have less erosion over time. The native plants also filter pollutants from runoff so they can help with um, algae problems long term. They discourage geese uh, and also provide the co benefit of pollinator habitat and added beauty from the native vegetation. Shoreline erosion we mentioned is a common issue, especially in wet ponds. The erosion is caused by wave action, uh, ice shear, or just gravity from the soil falling off over time. With turf grass basins, you have that lack of deep root systems that would stabilize the soil, and this can lead to exposed pipes and cause structures to fail. So some solutions would be to plant deep-rooted native vegetation to stabilize. Uh, you can even install a rock toe, as shown in this photo, um, for more severe cases. Um, in addition to that, um, regrading the banks may be necessary, uh, replacing structures, and ultimately a shoreline stabilization or a larger retrofit project may be needed. Some considerations. Uh, when implementing a project like this is that you're going to need assistance from an engineering and environmental firm. Uh, permits are required. Um, you'd have to hire a construction contractor and then there's costs to consider. So going over sedimentation again, um, this is really just a buildup of sediment from, from runoff or shoreline erosion. Uh, we talked about it causes shallower water, low DO, stagnant water, algae bloom, and ultimately fish kills. So solutions for sedimentation would be to plant aquatic and emergent plants. Um, dredging can be conducted, but that's, that's getting pretty complicated. So you need to consider um, costs and requirements for that. You can also retrofit to a wetland basin. So for a really sedimented pond, you're going to need assistance from an engineering or environmental firm, construction contractor. You may need a bathymetric survey. Uh, permits are required. Uh, consider if you have uh, wetlands or floodplain. And then if you do need to dredge, what to do with the sediment and consider cost. So 
So if you're considering basin retrofit, um, this may be needed if you have severe sedimentation or erosion, recurrent fish kills and algae problems, failing structures, or if you just want to convert from dry turf to an open water wetland basin. The benefits of a basin retrofit include fixing shoreline erosion, eliminating stagnant water, adding beautiful native plants, co-benefits of habitat for pollinators and other wildlife. They typically have a lower long-term cost and also grant funding may be available. Some considerations when looking at a base basin retrofit is the installation is typically a higher upfront cost. Uh, it looks different. It's not as manicured as a mode turf basin. So particularly in a shared space, you want to make sure you have neighborhood buy-in um, and, and educate the community on, on the changes and what the basin is going to look like. Um, particularly in the establishment period, the first three years, the native vegetation takes time to fill in. So they don't always look great right off the bat. So you want to make sure everybody is uh, aware and, and has buy-in in terms of the, the change. You would need assistance from an engineering and environmental firm, hire a construction contractor, permits are required, and along with the permit, you may have a management and monitoring period for that native vegetation. You also need to consider long-term management, so you would likely need to hire a native plant management contractor to uh, manage the native plants and any invasive species as they come in. So here's just a before and after photo of, uh, this is the village of Westmont, uh, 61st, and 61st and Richmond Detention Basin. Went from just an open uh, field of turf grass that looks like it got kind of soggy in the middle uh, between rain events. Um, and this was completely overhauled with native prairie plants. So not only does that add uh, beauty to the community, but is providing additional watershed or additional water quality benefits to the watershed. Okay, so the final section of my presentation um, is what you can do yourself and, and when you need help. So I'm getting a little short on time, so I'll just kind of run through this. It's a lot of what we talked about already. Uh, there are certain things you can do um, as the owner or an HOA uh, or a business owner uh, of a basin, um, inspect regularly, pick up trash, look for any blockages, um, install uh, waste stations for, for dog poop or for trash. Consider planting native vegetation, uh, eliminate fertilizer and pesticide use uh, around basins and areas that drain to them. Clean off your structures, um, trim vegetation around your inlet and outlet to make sure they're clear and keep leaves and grass clippings. So what can we help with? Um, I would recommend contacting DuPage County Stormwater Management or your municipality for assistance in verifying ownership. You could also check out our parcel viewer on our website. Um, we can give you advice on solutions. So if you have an issue with a, with a basin that you are responsible for, our staff is happy to help give advice on, on potential solutions for solving those problems. County staff can also perform wetland determinations, which is something I would recommend before in the early planning process of a retrofit uh, to determine if you have one on site that may kind of steer the direction that you need to go. And also we can identify harmful algae blooms. So if you suspect, if you have water that looks like green paint, um, please reach out to us uh, as soon as possible. We can come out and verify that with you. You may need to hire professionals, uh, depending on your situation and type of basin. Um, highly recommend hiring professionals for a naturalized basin. If you have native vegetation, uh, they are native plant management specialists, ecologists or botanists, 
Um, they can identify the beneficial native plants and the invasive species that may need to be controlled. They have licensed herbicide applicators um, that can target just the invasive species, make sure that herbicide is used properly, conduct high mows at certain times of year, targeting specific invasive species, doing prescribed burns or supplemental seeding. Uh, so really the, the management of a naturalized basin is a lot different than a, a turf basin. And so you're going to want to um, hire the appropriate contractor for that. With turf grass basins, you're looking at a general landscaping company. I and mean, you probably have one already, um, but some recommendations that I would have is making sure to mulch or remove those grass clippings from the basin, uh, limit fertilizer use and, and weed whip around those structures to keep them clear. If looking at a more um, intensive solution, such as dredging or shoreline stabilization or a complete retrofit, uh, you will need an engineering and environmental firm. Uh, they would do design of a basin reconstruction, come up with design for a shoreline stabilization plan, conducting topographic or bathymetric surveys, helping you to select native plants, and as well as putting together a permit application. So for those larger projects, you're definitely going to need an uh, engineering and environmental firm, and it's good to meet early and start planning. And once you're ready to go, you'll also, uh, for any implementation, uh, you may need a professional for that as well. For algae control, there are pond management companies. If that's your only concern, you may want to uh, hire a pond management company for algae remediation. I think they can also work on, on sedimentation issues. Um, if your structures are really blocked and have maybe haven't been cleaned in a while, you may need a contractor to do jetting out or vacuuming of those structures to make sure that they're flowing properly. And also for those larger uh, construction projects, such as a basin retrofit, shoreline stabilization, broken structures, sinkholes, uh, you would need a construction contractor to implement those, those designs. So we talked about a lot of cost uh, considerations during this presentation, um, but so I wanted to kind of highlight some potential funding sources that may be available. There is the DuPage County Water Quality Improvement Program grant and that is administered by DuPage County Stormwater Management. It funds up to 25% of construction costs for projects that provide a water quality benefit. The program is open to uh, DuPage County municipalities, townships, nonprofits, businesses, organizations, homeowners, associations, and individuals. So um, if you are looking to do a pond retrofit um, that is going to add a water quality benefit, um, we recommend you look into this grant. It's a competitive grant program. It's offered annually. Um, we usually open up for applications in October. I have the link here. You can find out more information. Um, and just have an example here of the Village of Carroll Stream project that uh, was awarded a uh, water quality improvement program grant and was able to retrofit a dry pond um, that was degraded, uh, aging basin that was degraded and um, converted into a um, water quality pond here. So two other potential funding sources I wanted to highlight are both from the Illinois EPA the Section 319 grant and the GIGO grant, which is the Green Infrastructure Grant Opportunity. Um, either of these can be um, applied for for a basin retrofit. The 319 requires that you have a project that prevent, eliminate, or reduce water quality impairments. And the GIGO is looking for providing water quality improvement through construction of BMPs, which are best managed practices. And this could also include a basin retrofit. The stipulation with the Illinois EPA grants is that the applicants must have legal status to accept funds from the state of Illinois. So if you are not that, um, you may want to consider partnering with your municipality. A municipality could be the lead agency. And for example, an HOA could partner with them on a basin uh, retrofit. Um, 
but the project type certainly applies and more information can be found. I have the links here. Um, and important to note, Section 319 can fund up to 60% of design and construction, and the GAIGO can fund up to 75%. So it's a potential good source of funding to get some of these implemented. So finally, just as a wrap up, uh, in summary, um, keep in mind all retention ponds, detention basins, all of those facilities we talked about today are connected to waterways. So they drain to our rivers and streams, and we should treat them as such a uh, part of our hydrologic system. They do require maintenance to function properly like anything built. They do require maintenance over time. Um, consider best practices and day-to-day -day activities to improve water quality. Um, that includes pet waste stations, trash cans, sustainable lawn care. Schedule re regular inspection of basins to make sure um, you're addressing things before they become a bigger issue. And for larger projects, such as a retrofit or shoreline stabilization may be needed, and uh, you may need to uh, call in some professionals at that point. And in order to do so, consider grant funding to offset some of that cost. Looks like I'm right on time, which is great. Uh, here's my contact information. Um, feel free to take that down. Um, we'll also post and share this presentation. Um, and if you have questions or want to talk about a specific project further, feel free to contact us. All right, very good. Thank you, Mary Beth. Um, why don't you take a quick drink because you, you're not done talking. You, we, right. We've got some questions <laughs> that have come in here. Um, so I'm going to jump into those right away. Um, how often should the regular inspections for blockages occur? I think this is at like the inlets and outlets of the detention basins. Sorry, I had to unmute. Um, it, it depends on the basin. So um, you may want to start out monthly. And if you're finding there's a lot to pick up or blockages are occurring, increase it. It really depends on the size of area that drains to your basin. If it's a large area, you may have more um, you know, trash and debris coming in, or if you're off of a busy road, that's a, a big source of trash sometimes. So it really depends on a case-to-case -case basis. I would re recommend you know, maybe starting monthly or quarterly and then going from there. Okay, very good. Um, here's, a, here's a good one here. Um, are the owners of the basin responsible for the maintenance of the sewer pipes entering the basin? That is a great question. Um, it depends. So again, you'd have to look at your easement documents, your plan of survey. Um, it depends on where the pipes are, if it's right off a, a road or another property. Um, you really have to look up that uh, documentation to see um, what, what was documented at the time of construction of who is responsible for that. So it can vary. It can be a public entity. It can be the private property. It really depends on where the pipe, the pipe is. Okay. Yeah, the next question, I think you've already answered. Yeah, we'll be, we'll be sending out a, a link with the recorded presentation and a, a, as well as the slides uh, shortly following the, the presentation. Actually, it might be next week, but we'll get those out to everybody. Uh, a couple other questions, though. In addition to the poop and the nuisance, uh, are there other reasons why geese are such a problem around these detention basins? Um, it's, I mean, it's really the poop is the problem. It, it adds a high source of nutrients and fecal coliform to the waterway. Um, the reason they like detention basins so much is, you know, they're Canada geese. They're they, they like open kind of tundra looking areas and we really created those with open water detention ponds that are mowed. So we really mimicked their natural habitat very well. And that's why we have so many of them in, in suburban areas. And it really does come down to um, the, the poop is really the issue of, of them. Yeah. Just the pollution to our water. All right. How often do you recommend a burn be done in natural detention basins? Three years to five years is, is kind of a rough estimate. Again, it depends on what sort of plant community you have. If there are a lot of um, dead vegetation building up over time, 
Um, for, for a lot of different natural communities, three to five years is usually standard, but uh, I would consult um, a professional on, on your basin, depending on the amount of vegetation you have and, and kind of make, make a plan from there. Okay, thank you. Um, here's a question, please address beaver management regarding seasonal tree damage and blockage of water outlet structures. Okay, um, good question. Um, you know, for, for beaver management, it's, it depends on, you know, how much you time you have to address it. Um, is it something that can be, you know, can you protect trees with, sometimes there can be plastic or metal kind of mesh put around the base of the tree to protect it. Um, beaver dams can also, if you catch them early, they can just be removed. Um, do you have someone that can do that, you know, over time and, and routinely, if beavers are a recurring problem, um, you know, I would recommend starting that way, uh, the less invasive method um, before, you know, moving on to any more of our permanent beaver removal techniques. Uh, I would recommend just trying to um, deter the beaver and protect your trees uh, before they start um, blocking things off. Yeah, very good. Um, uh, a couple other questions here. What are the cycles for 319 and GEIGO uh, call for projects? That's a good question. Um, I guess these are all, I'm saying these are all good questions. Um, for the Illinois EPA, um, usually it's August for 319. And GEIGO just started last year. So I'm not exactly sure when, what cycle that is. Um, I would check out um, the links that were provided um, in, in the PowerPoint for the most up-to-date cycles that they have. Um, it may change year to year, so I'm hesitant to give out a, a month, but I know 319 is usually August, but, but not always. And how about, can you address uh, permitting requirements for retrofits, bank stabilization, and other projects? Um, yes, it, it depends on what you want to do um, exactly. Uh, I would start with your community. So if you are in a municipality, village, city, contact your municipality first to, to determine what you need to do. If you're unincorporated, you can call DuPage County. Um, and I would just start off that, uh, have your property address or property, uh, your PIN number for the property to kind of steer you in the right direction. But it's really gonna depend on, on what you wanna do and, and the specific specifics for your site. So first step would just be call your municipality and, and go from there. Yeah, very good. Uh, there was a quick comment, uh, 1.75 pounds of fecal bacteria per goose per day. Yikes, I agree. Uh, and then one more question here. Uh, when is dredging required? Uh, what signals of events would trigger a dredging uh, may be required? So I hesitate, hesitated to get too much into dredging because it's, it's, it's expensive. It requires a lot of investigation and a lot of permitting. Um, but it is, it, it can be done. Um, usually in terms of requirement, it, it's in our detention basins, as long as your storage is retained for your, um, after a storm event, you, you don't have to dredge. It's more is, is the water quality being affected? Is it so sedimented in that you have recurrent algae blooms? or fish kills or really, you know, stagnant water that you may want to look into something like that to kind of uh, improve the water quality. And so again, it's kind of on a case by case basis. If you are experiencing frequent recurrent algae blooms and fish kills at that point, I would recommend dredging as a part of an overall retrofit. So not just getting rid of the sediment, but creating more of a constructed wetland pond with maybe open water portions and other portions have emergent wetland plants to um, 
provide water quality benefit at the same time, because if you just remove the sediment, it's, it is going to come back over time. And so really kind of looking at the basin at, at as a whole and coming up with some sort of uh, larger solution, dredging could be a part of that. Um, so again, on a case by case basis, it's really when, when you start having um, those low dissolved oxygen issues is, is when you might want to look into that. Um, just one quick one, uh, are, are past bathymetric surveys available for comparison? So I, I'm going to guess this question is in terms of looking at a basin, if you want to look at what it was constructed as versus, versus what it is currently. Um, I'll assume that's what the question is about. Um, okay, great. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so what I would recommend is trying to get your engineering plans and that may be a challenge for older ponds, but when that was built, there should be some sort of engineering plan for the design and construction of that pond. So start with your municipality and see if those plans are available or if you are the current owner, if you may have that somewhere with your property information, um, there should be a design um, plan that shows what the basin was constructed at or an as-built plan that is your baseline. And then your bathymetric survey would show what it is today. And uh, you can see how much it has filled in over time. Okay. All right, very good. Uh, I think that's all we have time for. Uh, great job, Mary Beth. And thank you again for sharing all your your knowledge and experience with us. Uh, I also want to thank all of our audience for joining us this afternoon. We hope you've enjoyed and learned a few things from the webinar. Uh, please remember, Mary will be sending uh, an email with a link to the uh, presentation, uh, a recording of the webinar, and of course that PDH certificate. Uh, right now we don't have a date set for our next webinar, but we will be getting that out to everybody very soon. Uh, so that's it. Thank you very much. Happy New Year, and uh, everyone have a great day.